Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. I'm a scholar of the Bible and religion. The fit for this video is Metallica and Justice. Let's take a look at a response to my video on the King James Version. Concerned with a translation that was defensible rather than accessible. Now Dan McClellan says a lot of silly things. He always has, but of all the claims he's made, this might be one of the most silly. Hey, what can I say? I'm a silly dude. The idea that the King James Bible, or the 1611, the translators thereof, the minds behind it, were somehow weighing and sacrificing accessibility of the translation for one that would be defensible is a cartoonish sentence. Well, let's consider that. One of the things I stated was that the King James Version was criticized by its contemporaries for being difficult to understand because of its literalness. Here is one example of that, a book by John Selden. This book was published in 1659. And we have in paragraph three here a discussion of the style of the King James Version, which Selden refers to as the best translation in the world. But he goes on, there is no book so translated as the Bible for the purpose. If I translate a French book into English, I turn it into English phrase, not into French English. Il fait froid. I say tis cold, not it makes cold. But the Bible is rather translated into English words than into English phrase. The Hebraisms are kept, and the phrase of that language is kept. As, for example, he uncovered her shame which is well enough so long as scholars have to do with it. But when it comes among the common people, Lord, what gear do they make of it? And gear there means mockery, as we see in David Norton's quotation of this review in his wonderful book, The King James Bible, A Short History from Tyndall to Today. And as you can see at the bottom of the page, after quoting Selden, Norton goes on, literal translation had used language fit for the purpose, but the people mocked it for its unnaturalness. This negative view of the King James Bible as English writing prevailed for roughly a century and a half, absolutely at odds with later admiration for the King James Bible as great, in some eyes the greatest, work of English literature. Norton also talks about this in his wonderful book, A History of the English Bible as Literature. On page 109, he talks more about Selden's review, saying it is supported by other pejorative comments on literalism and is at one with the prevailing scorn of older English and with the tendency towards archaism in the King James Bible. On another page, he states, A similar view seems to have been held by the satirist Samuel Hudibras Butler, who describes a hypocritical nonconformist as using the old phrases of the English translation of the Bible from the Jewish idiom as if they contained in them more sanctity and holiness than other words that more properly signify the same thing. Whatever the nonconformist thought of the King James Bible, Butler clearly saw it as a translation so literally made that it often failed to express meaning with the accuracy that might have been achieved. But now let's check out Seth Lehrer's paper, The KJV and the Rapid Growth of English in the Elizabethan Jacobian Era. Down at the bottom of the first page, much of its vernacular, as we well know, was cobbled together out of earlier translations, Tyndall and Coverdale in particular. And by the early 17th century, it was already perceived as old-fashioned. Certain grammatical uses, in particular the th suffix for the third person singular verb, and the grammatical gendering of particular nouns, for example, in the phrase, if the salt have lost his savor, were perceived by contemporaries as unrepresentative of everyday spoken usage. But there were others who enjoyed this fact about this literal approach to the King James Version. For instance, from the same volume, uh, the King James Bible after 400 years, Robert Alter talks about the question of eloquence in the King James Version. Down at the bottom, for the prose, the committees convened by King James adopted a translation strategy adumbrated by Tyndall a century earlier, meant to create close equivalence for the Hebrew diction and syntax 
and that resulted in a particular kind of forceful effect that was new in English. And then down lower on the page, laying everything out in these parallel structures is not, I think, a natural way to package units of syntax in English, though it became a viable option for literary English after the King James Version. The King James translators, by following the syntactic contours of the Hebrew, achieved a new kind of compelling effect, at once lofty and almost stark. The antithetical strategy of modern translations of the Bible by sundry scholarly ecclesiastical committees has been to repackage the syntax of the original in order to convey a sense that it might have been written in the 20th century. What is lost in eloquence is palpable. Now I want to focus for a second on this idea of eloquence. Here is Stephen Prickett's paper, Language Within Language, the King James Steamroller, down at the bottom. As David Norton has shown, if we go back to the first 200 years of the King James Bible, the evidence suggests both that the new version was not at first seen as in any way distinctive, nor was it greatly admired stylistically. Indeed, there is a paradox here in that this crescendo of praise has roots in a reaction against earlier 18th century criticism suggesting that the language of the King James Bible was harsh, uncouth, and obsolete. The second is that this praise, when it comes, is presented as exclusively aesthetic. And on the next page, if the King James Bible began with politics, it was driven by a kind of literalism which sought not to simplify, but to convey the original texts in all their full complexity, creating in the process a huge range of poetic phrases that have enriched both our language and our theology. So according to the leading scholars on the King James Version in the 17th and 18th century, not very popular, not very aesthetically pleasing. In the 19th century, suddenly aesthetically pleasing. Why? Because the ascetic qualities had become embedded within the linguistic foundations of English and particularly American English. This is what Alter praises. Pay attention to the only thing that this creator praises in this video.